yeah i'm a huge darkwing duck fan but man i'm so excited about this interview we got today mike because i'm a huge transformer sucker oh yes i am welcome to the saint canard files a darkwing duck podcast we got a flash crack episode i'm your host will santana and i'm mike russo and who are you the sandman (laughs) <laughs> well hey mike man we got a, a pretty fun interview we're gonna have today man yeah we have neil ross and who do you voice will oh he's known for it not off on dark queen man mm-hmm. yes oh, he is amongst yeah. many other things oh yeah amongst the other ones but i think not off is by far his most popular character he did on dark queen oh yeah definitely unless oh, you really yeah. love that talking fridge all right well mike let's go ahead and get into our interview with neil ross man all right let's take it away let's go all right so nice to have you on neil oh my pleasure nice to be with you guys so um i figured we'd start off by talking a little bit about what your influences were growing up did you have any favorite cartoons or voices that you enjoyed cartoons no voices yes uh we didn't have a television set for a long time. I don't think we got one until I was about 12. And um, because of a, a weird set of laws, and I was living in Montreal, Canada at the time, and uh, because of a weird set of laws, uh, children couldn't go to most movies. So I saw very few cartoons. However, I did a tremendous amount of uh, listening to the radio and uh This was in the late 50s, and so there was still a lot of uh, radio drama, radio comedy. Uh, We heard a lot of stuff from the States, the Jack Benny show, Suspense. uh, uh, And that's probably my major influence is is the stuff I heard coming out of that radio because I was endlessly fascinated at the, the variety of voices and accents that you would hear and then I got into some of the radio comedy. Uh, a huge influence on me was a radio show from England called The Goon Show. And in this country, goon means like a guy who breaks your legs because you didn't pay your gambling debts. But it, it doesn't, it, it, <laughs> more, it's more like idiot in England. So you might call it The Idiot Show. And it was just three guys, and they. Between the three of them, they created innumerable characters, and the writing was brilliant. And uh, one of the three guys went on to become a huge star, and that, his name was Peter Sellers. Oh, Peter Sellers. Okay. And uh, it's been so long now, maybe people are not that familiar with him. And probably the biggest movie he was ever in was called a thing called Being There, where he didn't do voices or anything like that, but he, he was phenomenal. He was amazing. And uh, I, I listened to that show compulsively and I would try to reproduce the voices that I heard. And, uh, it, it became sort of a hobby, you know, uh, some kids build model planes and, uh, other kids sit in their room and do stupid voices for no apparent reason. <laughs> and, uh, so that was, I, that, that, that was kind of my primary influence. So so I guess you always wanted to be go into voice acting because I guess that was something you always wanted to do then. Well, I didn't, you know, radio drama ended before I got out of high school. Television put an end to that. Right. And um, no, I didn't even know the business of voiceover even existed. I didn't find out about it until uh, the early 70s. So how'd you get into it? Well, what happened was I I got seduced uh, by uh, the devil's music, rock and roll. Uh oh. In my in my book, which hopefully we'll talk about later on, I I, I mentioned the moment when suddenly a song by Little Richard came on the radio, and prior to that time, I had not really enjoyed music very much. I found it rather dull and the 50s pop tunes that were on the radio, I just thought were insipid. And suddenly, <laughs> standing in the kitchen of a friend's house, this song came on, and I just had this electric feeling that went from my toes right up to the top of my head. I, I was just seized by this joy at this song and the way this man sang it and the, and the musicians and what they did. And, of course, that was my first rock and roll record. And... Uh, I quote the late Lemmy Kilmister of uh, Motorhead talking to a younger musician, and he says, uh, 
Well, the difference between you and me is I remember when there was no rock and roll. You don't. Well, let me tell you, it was effing horrible. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, That's great. So I started listening to the radio to hear this music. And as time went on, uh, I became more and more fascinated with uh, the guys who played the music, the disc jockeys. And eventually I decided to become one. And that's what I did for the next 21 years. And I would do little voices on the air and in commercials and things like that. But it never occurred to me to make a career out of it until I found out. Well, I began, you know, I began to wonder who are the people that voice these cartoons? Who are the people who do the voiceovers? And I didn't even know the term voiceover, but who are the voices in television commercials and radio commercials? Who, you know, and I developed a theory that they were probably on camera people making a couple extra bucks on the side, which might have been true in some cases. But finally, in 1970, 1970, somebody uh, told me there's a business called voiceovers and uh, some of the guys are very, very, very successful. And I began to think, man, that's for me. <laughs> you got to get in on it, huh? Well, I just, you know, I, I was beginning to become disenchanted with radio I f and I began to realize I was only using 30 or 40 percent of my potential and some of the stuff I did was not being appreciated by management. And I thought if ever I sat down and tried to invent a business for myself to get into, it would be voiceovers. And now I've found out it actually exists. So, you know, I have to do this. And it took me another uh, 10 years or so to get the job done, but eventually I did. Right. So um, can you tell us a little bit, little bit about um, your earliest work in voiceovers? Like, what were your earliest roles? Well, you're, you're talking about animation? Yes, animation. Yeah, the first animation job I or jobs I ever did, I got called in by Wally Burr. And I, that name may be familiar to you. I don't know. He was. I, a, reckon, I recognize it. Yeah. A, a voice director, uh, best known for uh, directing uh, G.I. Joe and Transformers. But he was doing an ep he was doing a version of Spider-Man in the late 70s, early 80s. And he through a, a connection I made with my agent, he brought me in and I just did incidental characters, you know, a cop mm -hmm. who has two lines, a parking lot attendant who has three lines, this kind of thing. And then uh, the big breakthrough was getting into Hanna Barbera. Uh, I would drive Hanna by Barbera. Yep. Yeah, I would drive by that lovely building on Cahuenga Boulevard West and think, Am I ever going to be able to get in there somehow? And uh, yeah, they were the kings back then. Yes, they were. They really were. And uh, they began to institute a policy whereby if you had never worked for them before, you could make an appointment, come in, and do an audition. And you could do anything you wanted. You had five minutes. And uh, I did one of those auditions. And shortly after that, they called me in and I did a guest uh, shot on a show called Richie Rich. Right. Richie Rich. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That, 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 those two jobs were the first. And I nope. cannot tell you how great it felt to drive up to. They had a guard gate, just like a big movie studio, you know. Right. To, to drive up to that gate, roll the window down and say my name and have the guy say, uh, OK, go ahead and open the barrier instead of saying, are you kidding? Get out of here. <laughs> hey, you know, um, throughout the course of our podcast, whenever we get to a voice actor, we discuss their career briefly. And, yeah, it's amazing how many voice actors started with Hanna-Barbera. That policy must have really started a lot of careers. Yeah, it well, I had again, I, I mentioned all this in my book, but I had spoken to an agent previously and he liked my character work. But then he said, ah, you're never going to get anywhere. Hanna-Barbera, they just hire the same five people over and over again, which was true at the time. You yeah, know, people, Dawes Butler, Don Messick. Yeah, those guys. yeah. Uh, 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 and, and the lovely June Foray. Right. They. You know, but what had what had happened was uh, some of the regulations involving children's television had changed and a lot of people were getting into the business. And uh, Hanna-Barbera hired a guy named Gordon Hunt. 
and they basically put him in charge of the voice department. He directed all the shows. He did all the casting with uh, his assistant, Jenny McSwain. And, and Gordon said, we got to broaden the talent base here because the competition is increasing exponentially. And he's the one who instituted this policy of letting people come in and audition. And that's how a lot of us came in through the door. If he hadn't done that, who the hell knows what would have happened? I, I don't know. Well, you know what? Jenny McSwain is a great segue. I know we want to talk a bit about your 80s roles, and I know Will's very excited to talk about that. But <laughs> I want to jump ahead a little bit to Darkwing Duck, and I know Jenny McSwain was the voice director for that show. And do you have any memories of working on Darkwing? You know, it's funny. I even looked at, at an episode I was in, and it's like total amnesia. Uh, of course it's me. There's no question about that. But do I remember doing any of that? I remember the studio uh, because a number of shows were done there. It was a place, I don't think it's uh, there anymore. It was a place called Screen Music on Ventura Boulevard in the San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. And I can recall working with Ginny on many, many occasions. She was the one who ran my Hanna-Barbera audition. That's when I met her. Oh, and wow. She, she was across the glass when I did that five-minute uh, thing. And uh, we've always had a great relationship over the years. And, um, you know, I remember working with her. But, you know, the only memory that I can really conjure up is uh, remembering how impressed I was with Jim Cummings. Which, right. I was going to ask you next what it was like working with Jim's. Or we are. I can talk about it now. Up to you. Hmm? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a relatively small talent pool in those days. It was growing, but we kind of all knew each other. Even if we didn't know names necessarily, you recognized faces. And there was a place called the Voice Caster. They're still around. They cast voices. And uh, I remember seeing a new face, and eventually someone there said, uh, keep your eye on him. This is a guy named Jim Cummings, and we're just uh, floored by how talented he is. He, he, he's going places. I said, okay, good. And then I got cast in a show called Visionaries, and I had the lead role, and Jim got a, a part in the show. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it was not a part that really allowed him to showcase uh, really, a, you know, even a tenth of what he was capable of doing. And I thought, well, this is the guy they were talking about. OK, fine. And then I got called in to do this thing on Darkwing Duck. And I he now he had a chance to show what he was really capable of. And I was just so impressed, uh, you know, he, He's a phenomenal talent, and uh, he's one of those guys where I feel it, a privilege just to get to uh, share a microphone with him. You know, it's like, what the hell am I doing here? I can't, uh, you know, I can't do half the stuff this guy's doing. And did everybody record together in the same studio? Yes, yes. In those days, uh, they wanted, almost without exception, full cast Uh now, I'm not talking specifically about uh, Disney or Darkwing Duck. I mean, the whole industry. Right. Uh, uh, they, th There were certain uh, producers who would threaten to fire you if you if you weren't available for a session. Uh, and it, it amuses me how it's completely changed now. Nowadays, they, they, they basically record everybody separately. Yeah, I've, I've heard that's how it is now. That's a shame. And, and you know... I, it, it was so important back then, and now they're doing it in a completely opposite way, and everything's fine. It, it, it's, yeah. it's funny. I think the reason they got into doing that is when they started hiring all these celebrities, they're simply not available that much. No. Grab mm -hmm. them when you can. And uh, if you say to a celebrity, well, if you don't show up, we're getting rid of you. It's like, well, goodbye, because I got a lot of other irons in the fire. I don't need you guys. Mm-hmm. So they've been forced to do it, and I think eventually over time it just turned into the standard of the w of the way they do everything. I Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a shame. I mean, the, the, the joy of the work when you're acting, it's I, I liken it to a tennis match 
you get a more natural back and forth when you're in the same room with each other. Exactly. Definitely. A great tennis player playing another great tennis player gives you an incredible volley to the point where you don't even care who wins the point. It's it's just magic. But you put him in a, a tennis match with a mediocre player, he's not going to look as good because he's Gabe. getting lobs. He's not getting, you know, stuff he can work with. And it's the same with acting. Yes, I can deliver a performance out of context. And I like to think I do a pretty good job, but I always wonder how much better this would have been if if Jim, for instance, had been there and fed me his line and I bounced off it. Now, um, going specifically to Ghoul of My Dreams, uh, the voice of Nodoff, did you base it off of something? Was that, was that anything, did anything inspire you to do that voice? Um, I can't remember specifically, but the way I work and I imagine 99% of my compatriots do the same thing. You come in, there's a drawing of the character, maybe a couple of drawings of the character. There's a one or two paragraph description of the character. And as you absorb all of that, uh, if things go well, you begin to hear a voice in your head. And then the trick is to reproduce that voice and hope that uh, the powers that be like what you've come up with. So I have no doubt that I came in, Ginny showed me pictures and discussed the character with me, and I began to do various things, and at some point she would say, that, that's it, that's it, that, I like that, do that. That's probably what happened, but I don't remember specifically. Okay. Great, great voice, though. Fun character. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Do you have any memories of working with Kat Sose? Oh, absolutely, sure. Because um, I know um, in the episode, uh, the main one, the not off episode, uh, she was one of the main characters in that one too. Yes, I noticed that. Actually, I pr uh, she pronounces it Susie. Oh, so I have been wrong this entire time. Okay. Not to worry. It's kind of an unusual name, and it's not intuitive. But yeah, uh, yeah, I've worked with her. I haven't seen her in ages, but. I worked with her on umpteen different shows, and, and she she's another one. She's just uh, she's just amazing, very very talented woman, and uh, always a pleasure to work with. Now, um, speaking of characters, we're gonna back we're gonna back up to the eighties because I know Will Will's really <laughs> excited to talk about some of your eighties roles. So I'm gonna let Will take it away from here. Go All ahead, right, Will. Neil. All right, Neil, I'm gonna be a little different on this portion of the interview. Um, I'm a big, big Transformers fan, so I'm gonna have to make you choose between the Autobots, Dinobots, Constructicons, or Decepticons because you were all four of those. <laughs> you got to pick one. I'm gonna put you on the spot. You know, the my great confession is, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I don't know how many of of the actors even understood what was happening most of the time. <laughs> uh, I auditioned, I forget which part I got first. It would have been Hook Slag or Bone Crusher. Mm -hmm. And I got the part and I came in and the session was in progress. And I, there was no Bible to read, you know, no show synopsis to read. You just came in and did the line and uh, Wally would say, no, no, I need more of this or less of that. But as far as what any of this meant or what was happening, I, I you know, we were semi clueless. Now, another character you did that was really popular, he didn't show up until the movie, uh, Springer. But Springer has a iconic line that's easily top three lines in that movie. Can you say that line? Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, at the, I, when I recorded the line, uh, no bells went off, no rockets fired. But when the movie premiered in, at a theater in Westwood, uh, mm -hmm. and that line happened... The whole place went nuts, uh, cheering, yelling, screaming. Uh, the next few lines of dialogue were completely obliterated. Nobody heard them. And I thought, <laughs> wow, I'm on to something. And yes, yes, of course, I know the line. Uh, I've got better things to do tonight than die. Oh, man. Mike, I know you're not a Transformers guy, but that line came at a crucial time in the movie it was like a big old battle between the decepticons and the autobots and 
the Autobots were getting slaughtered. And right when he says that line, a few more things happen. And then the big hero, Optimus Prime, Peter Cullen comes in, you know, and saves the day. <laughs> so that line is just so iconic for all the Transformers fans. And it came right in the movie. And like Springer was a, a unknown character. So for his character to come in and that line is such a crucial moment. It just solidify his character for the, for the rest of the show, you know? It's wonderful to have a signature line. Uh, mm -hmm. Not many actors get that, you know, but uh, Al Pacino has hoorah! <laughs> but I've got better things to do tonight than <laughs> die. Now, Neil, uh, you got a history with Michael Bell. Uh, he's all, Michael Bell played Quacker Jack on Darkwing. Uh, he did several voices on uh, G.I. Joe, and he did uh, also one of the Dinobots in um, Transformers. Right. You know, what, what was it like working with Michael Bell, man? Well, of course, Michael Bell was one of the most successful voice actors in the, gosh, I, I don't know exactly when he broke through, probably late 60s, all the way through the 70s, all the way through the 80s. He was like, uh, you know, the Clark Gable of voiceovers, because he, uh, he, he did it all. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, animation actors basically only do animation or games they really don't break through as far as a commercial spokesperson some do but some mm -hmm. don't but michael was just as successful as a commercial spokesperson as he was in animation he he was everywhere and so i mean i was hugely uh, intimidated to get in a room with him uh, he was he's another one you say what am i doing here <laughs> and actually uh, <clears throat> the first, uh, breakthrough for me was GI Joe. I started doing that before I did transformers and, uh, he happened to mention he was uh, doing an animation workshop and I signed up instantly. And so it was funny at night I'd be in his class. And then the next morning, uh, bleary eyed at 9 AM, we'd show up at Wally's to do uh, a, a session for GI Joe. So I was sort of doing on the job training. I would actually use stuff I'd learned the night before <laughs> in the session. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, He's an, just had such an extraordinarily successful career. And he's what's good about him, he still teaches. <laughs> a lot of actors, you say, well, how do you do what you do? And I don't know, man. I just say the words, you know. I, I, I. But Michael has actually sat down and analyzed uh, how he's able to do a lot of what he does. And, and so if you take a class with him, you get very specific, very helpful information. And uh, he's rare in that in that respect. A lot of actors either don't really know how they do what they do, or they or they are reluctant to share it. And, but he is uh, he's he's got a lot of good info. Anyway, I'm sorry. What was the next question? The the question was about shipwreck. Is that one of your favorite characters? You've uh you got the voice. Yes, yes. It's one of the you know part of the reason that uh, I like it is because the fans like it. You know, obviously, uh, if you strike a nerve with a character, you fall in love with that character. But uh, no, shipwreck to me is uh, unique in in GI Joe in that the good in in GI Joe, you know, the good guys are really really good and the bad guys are really really bad. And shipwreck is somewhere in the middle. He wants to do the right thing, but he doesn't like taking orders. Mm -hmm. And so he's always kind of doing things his way and getting into trouble for it. And uh, he reminds me of guys I knew when I was in the Navy, uh, just skating along just this side of insubordination and had been in long enough where they figured out how to work the system. <laughs> and they would, <laughs> would always have a, a little scam going on the side and uh, it just made the character much more interesting than if he was just a straight ahead, good guy or bad guy. Okay. Now, um, Neil, uh, transformer fans will kill me if I don't even mention this real quick. Can you say anything about Peter Cullen and Frank Welker? Well, where do I start? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Peter and I share, um, a, a weird connection in that we're both from Montreal, Canada. 
And so there's a certain brand of Montreal humor that he does that nobody else would understand, but uh, unless you've been in Montreal for a period of time. And so uh, just, uh, you know, it's that that voice is just so amazing. And uh, of course, Frank. uh, Wow, I, I think he probably has more IMDb credits than any other actor. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds about right. I'm not joking. Of course, part of the reason is that if you're a face actor, you work on a movie, you might work on it for six months, and that's one credit. Voiceover, you run into a job, you might do three jobs a day, and that's three credits. So it's easier for us to rack up a big list of credits. But still, Frank, I haven't looked him up lately. The last time I looked, it was something like 800 credits. Oh, wow. And I think I'm cruising along with, I don't I forget now, 275 or something like that. And, uh, uh, you know, aside from his voice work, Frank's uh, ability to do sound effects. Oh, that's incredible. It's just astonishing. He does a thing. I don't know if he's ever used it on um, uh, in a work situation or, or done it to where it was actually ended up in a show. But he can stand in front of a microphone, not moving a muscle. And he can make this sound that sounds exactly like electronic equipment frying. It's a kind of a, I can't do it, but it's. (laughs) And I've seen him do this. And engineers are leaping out of their chairs and diving under the desk, trying to find the short in the equipment (laughs) before it burns up. And of course, the equipment's fine. It's Frank, you know, and he's got this little smile on his face. <laughs> he finally says, no, no, it was me, fellas. You're, you're, the, the place isn't burning down. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my book, I say that we, um, we w- one day we, we decided someday a, a director's going to ask Frank to do an iguana fart. <laughs> and he will come up with something and we'll say, yeah, that's it. <laughs> know that anywhere. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> As now, Neil, a, to my knowledge, but we're waiting. <laughs> now, Neil, are you out there in the uh, convention circuits? Are you out there doing cons and comic cons and stuff like that? Expos? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 over the years. Mm-hmm. Do you I, have any coming up? Two or three a year. Yeah. I'm going to do, um, the uh, Garden State Comic Fest in uh, Morristown, New Jersey at the end of June. Oh, that's not very far from me. I live on Long Island. Oh, wow. I might actually go to that. I will be in your hood. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, that's the the, uh, only one I have at the moment. But, yeah, I, I usually end up doing, I don't know, two or three a year. Oh, okay. Now, Neil, uh, you want to plug in your book? Uh, tell us a little bit about your book and where we can find it at. Yes, uh, I finally sat down and wrote uh, the uh, incredible saga of my life. Uh, the book is titled Vocal Recall. The subtitle is A Life in Radio and Voiceovers, and that pretty much tells you what the book's about. But if you have any interest in uh, any of these shows that we have discussed thus far, I talk about what it was like to work on them and and the people that I worked with and uh, stuff like that. The book is available at Amazon. It's available at Audible, or you can go to a nifty little website I created for the book, which is www.neilbook.com. And all the information is there. So it's not too hard to track it down. Yeah, for everyone listening, I will put all those links and uh, the description, the book title, all that stuff in our description of this podcast. So it'll be easier for you guys to find. All right. Uh, hey, Neil, do you want to plug people or where they, how they can find you on social media or anything? Well, I'm on Facebook, uh, and that's about it. I'm kind of a Luddite when it comes to uh, <laughs> all this uh, digital world. Uh, yeah, Facebook's about it. And I, if, if you're interested, uh, 
I didn't really put it up for fans, but I, I have no problem if anybody wants to go there. Uh, I put up a website that's primarily for people who hire voiceover artists to listen to my demos. But as I said, the uh, folks are welcome to do that too. And that uh, website is cleverly titled neilross.com, N-E-I-L-R-O-S-S.com. I paid a consultant a fortune to come up with that name. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, if you go there, you see a scene of the city and it's got billboards. And if you click on the individual billboards, you hear uh, vo my voice demos, which I don't know how thrilling that is. But if, if you enjoy that kind of thing, uh, be my guest. All right, so you Voltron fans, G.I. Joe fans, Spider-Man fans, Transformers, Darkwing Duck, a, uh, Neil Ross, he's out there. Go find his book and make sure you check out check him out on social media as well. I couldn't ask for more. <laughs> well, for more. well, thank you for being our guest today, Neil. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you for asking me, and uh, I hope your uh, finished product is a huge success. We appreciate that. All right, man. What did you think of that interview with Neil, Mike? Oh, that was a lot of fun. That oh, was yeah. fun. Yeah, you know, I had to sneak in on some little Transformer stuff, some Frank Welker and Peter well, Cullen questions. <laughs> that's what he's known for, the working on those shows. And Welker and Cullen, they're, those guys are legends, man. Yeah, man. I, I know we brought him on for Darkwing, but it was just such an honor to get him to say that iconic line from Transformers, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. But hey, guys, man, um, we appreciate y'all tuning in to the, our, our Flash Quack episode. Mike, where can they listen to us at? Spotify, um, Stitcher, Google Play, um, Apple devices, YouTube. We're on YouTube, of course. Uh, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, all tons of different apps that too numerous for me to even name, as well as um, Amazon Echo, iHeartRadio and Pandora. So you guys have lots of options. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, we got one more treat with y'all with Neil, but you got to stay tuned to Ghoul of My Dreams to hear that treat. Mm-hmm. That's a few months from now, but you guys will love it when you hear it. Oh, yeah. Stay dangerous. Good night. I got better things to do tonight than die.